Okay, so are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions on what we've covered so far? Or anything else about the class? Okay, I'm seeing no's. Good. Then let's continue. There is uh, nothing this week except the learning chapter due. Next week there will be another test due based on states of mind and learning. We're going to finish states of mind today. And then on Thursday we'll do, we'll start the learning chapter. So states of mind. Let me change my, this is where we were when we ended last time, states of mind. Thank you, Jacob, for saying that you are here. And I showed you that we are awake, then we go into stage one, sleep, stage two, three, and four. Then we come out of it, three, two, and go up to REM, sleep, then back down again into stage four. Maybe a second time, but you'll notice it doesn't happen any other time because once you hit stage four and you have refreshed, there's no need to hit stage four anymore. Stage four is very specific for getting your brain all set up uh, for the next day and washing out, flushing out all the uh, garbage that's in your neurons. So then we go back into REM, we go back down into stage three, then back up into REM, stage three, back up into REM, stage two, back into REM, and the last time we're in REM is about 60 minutes, where the first time we're in REM is about 10 minutes. So we don't stay in uh, REM the same amount of time the whole night, and we will wake up from REM usually some people say they've been dreaming, but other people not. And we'll wake up from REM when there's something in our environment that wakes us up, or after 60 minutes, we'll wake up at that point. Thank you, Alexander, for saying that you are here. Babies will sleep a tremendous amount of time. They can sleep 16 hours a day, but they don't sleep all 16 hours at once. They sleep an hour, then they wake up crying, then they sleep another hour, then they wake up crying, then they sleep another hour, then they wake up crying, and <laughs> you never get any good sleep for the first two years of probably of having a child. I skipped that. I went directly to nine years old when I adopted, so I didn't have to worry about it. Anya, say, Naya, Anaya, thank you for um, logging in. So... <laughs> I, I never actually had that problem, but some of you may be mothers or fathers, and you remember the time when your child was so young that you didn't get any sleep. It's basically uh, a nightmare all the time. And if the child is really upset or sick, then it's even worse. But having uh, a little child, cats don't sleep Cats don't sleep off and on. They sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. They sleep 20 hours a day. They're only awake about four hours a day. And I have 10 of those cats, and oh, my gosh, they're asleep when I wake up. And then they go downstairs to get fed, and then they go back to sleep again. And when I come back from work, they're, they're still asleep. So I wake them up and feed them again, and then they sit on my lap while I'm watching TV and they sleep again and then I go back upstairs and they get on the bed and they go to sleep again and usually when they wake up to play it's about three o'clock in the morning and like no go away I'm trying to sleep <laughs> so that's cats and uh, when we're talking about dreaming cats how many of you have dogs or cats either one dog or cat <laughs> yeah so both, both, some, both dogs, dogs. Yes, okay. Have you ever seen them when they're sleeping, feet are moving because they it looks like they're chasing after some animal or in a field somewhere, right? Have you seen that in your animals? Yes, you guys have seen that. And so we say they're dreaming about, you know, chasing something. And this is a trap. This is the trap of animal psychology. When we are sleeping and dreaming, we are paralyzed. We sleepwalk in a different stage, stage two or stage three, we're, stay, we're sleepwalking. So it isn't, if, the, if dogs and cats are like us, they're not dreaming. They're just 
they're sleepwalking. <laughs> and we tend to say they're dreaming, and that's the trap of animal psychology. You have to be sure to describe exactly what the behavior is and not give it some human anthropomorphic type of description. There's a video on YouTube of a dog that's doing that, and then it rolls over, and it actually gets up, and then it runs across the room and slams into a wall and wakes up because it was sleep running, <laughs> sleep running. So dreaming, we're not sure. We can't wake up an animal and say, are you dreaming? They might be different than us. They might actually be dreaming during that stage while they're moving, but it's very difficult to determine if that's what's happening to them. So why do we dream? There are two different theories about why we dream. First one is Freud's, and that's dreams are meaningful events we played in our minds to reduce the stresses they cause or to work through unresolved conflicts. That's purposeful. We have a reason for the dream that our brain wanted to do something. The other one is we have a reason, but it's accidental. Dreams are caused by a random brain activity which activates neurons and the brain must make some sort of sense out of a memory neuron that's been activated. In either case, we know that we must have REM sleep. Without REM sleep, we show a mark to decrease in the ability to store long-term memories and retrieve them. So when you are taking a test, make sure that you've had a very good night's sleep and hopefully dream and had REM sleep at least so that you're prepared when you take the test to be able to recall those memories. So dreams as meaningful offense are Freud's ideas. Freud and other psychoanalysts said that dreams were unconscious desires and unresolved issues of the day that are worked out in your sleep to serve as sources of wish fulfillment as well. And there are differences in dream content by age, gender, and culture. But the differences don't depend upon whether it is purposeful or accidental. Children dream differently than adults do. Men dream differently than women do. In Asian cultures, they dream differently than they do in our culture, which is the difference between collectivism and individualism. So that's cultural differences. And it really doesn't matter whether it was purposeful or accidental, we're still going to dream differently. Because in the accidental, it's your memories that are activated accidentally, and somehow your brain has to make sense out of that random activity. And it's your memories are based on <laughs> your age, your sex, your, uh, your culture, your religion, your morals and ethics, so it's still going to be based on those things. And the last thing that you, we have something called long-term potentiation. So the last thing that you thought of as a memory is going to be the one that's easiest to activate by mistake. And so that could very well be the next thing that is activated while you're sleeping, and you have to make a, a dream that makes sense out of that last memory that you were thinking about before you went to sleep, or the things that you've worked out during the day that you've really tried to figure out during the day. The desires that you have, the unresolved conflicts of their day are all parts of your memory system, and they're the major possible reasons why you are going to randomly activate those particular memories. They're easier to, met, to activate once they've been activated, for a little while anyway. There, no matter which theory is correct, we know that we stay in REM sleep for about 10 minutes the first time we enter REM, and we enter REM many times during the night, and the last time we're there for about 60 minutes if we wake up from our dream but less than 60 minutes if the alarm clock goes off or the cat or dog walk into the room and jump on you. So some of the terms that are associated with dreams, the latent content is the content that's the hidden meaning of the dream, the unresolved conflicts possibly of your day, the issues that you've been working on during the day. There's the latent content. 
The manifested content is the actual manifested dream. The thing that happens, the dream that you're having is the manifested dream. A manifested dream, according to Freud, has a reason for being. It's not just a accidental memory connection. And so he says, we are, we have this thing that's bothering us, and we make a dream to make it better. So here's an example. How many of you have ever had a dream where you were flying? You just put out your arms and the wind just picks you up and you fly over the trees and fly over the city, fly over your house. Anybody? So I'm seeing lots of no's. My last class, there were a few that had had, had that dream. So let's say that you have been seeing a therapist and you go to the therapist one day and you say, I just had this really weird dream. And I was spread out my arms and I just flew into the sky and I could fly anywhere I wanted to. The therapist would say to you, well, and this happens to men more than women, but well, we have been talking about the fact that you're about to get married. And there is this whole idea that men seem to have that when they get married, they have a ball and chain wrapped around their leg and they're now helpless, they can't go anywhere or do anything, they're tied down. And if that is a worry for you, then the best way to get rid of that worry is to dream that you are completely free and how, how much freer can you be than when you're and flying? So you're flying. And that is a possible reason for having that particular dream, is that you're about to be tied down by something. You could get a new job that seems to be tying you down or a, an old job that where you're changing what you're doing at the job and you're feeling tied down. In many cases, in jobs, they're now firing people and then the people that are left over have two times the work to do or three times the work to do. It's feeling tied down, so you have a dream about flying and you feel more free. You get rid of that feeling of being tied down. So according to Freud, that latent feeling, whatever it is, that, that reason for the dream, creates something called a dream work, and the dream work is used to manifest the dream that you have, the actual content of the dream, to help you to get rid of the issues of your life. So that's dream states. There is a type of dream where you actually, you know you're dreaming. Have any, have any of you had a time where you're dreaming and you realize this is a dream, but you haven't woken up and you know, hey, I'm dreaming. Some of you have. Oh, more, more than I would have thought said yes. So this is a possible part of lucid dreaming. You recognize that you're dreaming since you are sort of conscious, this is a very strange conscious area, you're asleep, but you're conscious and aware of the fact that you're dreaming. You can now take control of your dream and do whatever you want to in that dream. That's part of lucid dreaming. Have any of you ever been able to control your dreams? Some of you have. Most of you probably have not. It's a, not an easy thing to do because as soon as you try to control your dream, most people will wake up from it. But some people can stay in the dream and control the dream. So sort of like I'm in my car with my wife driving down the road in my Honda Accord, and I realize this is a dream. I'm dreaming. So, hey, I've always wanted a Tesla. And I know what a Tesla feels like because I've sat inside of a Tesla before. So now all of a sudden, I'm with my wife and we're in a Tesla. And I've trained as a pilot. So hey, why can't my Tesla fly? Pull back on that steering wheel and shoo, I'm into the air. I'm flying in my Tesla with Christy Brinkley. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's controlling your dreams. Lucid dreaming is possible. People do have control over their dreams in research. 
we wake people up slightly. We have little lights around their eyes so that as we see that they're going into REM sleep, we flash the lights a little bit and it pulls them slightly out of the dream state so that they now are aware that they are dreaming and they can control the dream, supposedly, in these research projects that they do. But there's another aspect to lucid dreaming, and that is something called astral projection. Astral projection is leaving your body, looking around, and then coming back into your body again and telling somebody what it was that you saw. And lots of people in hospitals have done this, supposedly. They're in a hospital situation where they're in surgery. They're knocked out by the anesthetic, and yet they say they were floating above their body watching the surgery happen, and then they came back into their body and they could tell what they could tell you what a nurse was doing in the room, what a doctor was doing in the room. They could tell you everything about what was happening in the room. But they may be knocked out, but our brain never stops functioning, even though we're knocked out and our ears are still working. We may not be able to see anything or feel anything, but our ears are still working. So we can hear what's going on in the room. Maybe they're just making up a dream in their head about what they're hearing in the room. But there are those people, strange people, who say that they floated above their bodies in the surgery room, and then they, it was boring. So they left the room, went somewhere else in the hospital, and then when they wake up, they can tell you what was happening in the rest of the hospital. Now that's weird, and that's astral projection. And that's the point of astral projection. The United States government has spent billions of dollars studying astral projection. And the Russian government has spent billions of dollars studying astral projection. Can you figure out why they would do this? This is a waste of money as far as I'm concerned. But why would they spend billions of dollars trying to research astral projection? Nobody has a clue. Somebody in the last, there we go, Catherine has figured it out. If I'm an American soldier and I can speak Russian, I know Russian really well, then I can go to sleep in the Pentagon, astral project over to the Kremlin, listen to everything that they're saying there, come back, wake up, and tell all of my bosses what they're planning to do in the Kremlin. Perfect spy. You can't catch them. You can't kill them. Now, the federal government does not spend any money on this anymore, neither does Russia anymore, and there's a reason for that. And I, most of my students will say, yeah, because you just can't do that. It just, it's not possible. But I'll take the other side of it, and I'll say, okay, what if it was possible? And why wouldn't they be spending money on it anymore? And the reason would be we have embassies in every country in the world, except for North Korea. And those embassies are in many cases in hostile territory. Russia is not a friendly nation, neither is China, but we have embassies there so that we don't get into a war immediately. We actually have somebody there that can talk to the other person, go, wait, 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 this is a, you're, you're looking at this the wrong way. <laughs> We're not trying to go to war. And so we have these places. And of course, our enemies are listening in on those places all the time. So these buildings are hardened. They're called hardened buildings, which means you can't hear anything that's going on in them. All the communication that's coming out of them is encrypted, and you can't get that, you can't figure out what the information is. And so maybe, I'm taking the opposite side now, maybe during this research they found a way to harden the Pentagon and all of our embassies against astral projection spies. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I've never astral projected, so I can't say anything about it, and I don't know any of the research that's being done in it um, or had been done in it, but we're not spending a lot of money in it anymore, and so who knows why. So according, if for those of you who have never astral projected but can control your dreams. The, what they say is, in order to astral project, 
you walk over to a cliff in your dream and jump off and fly and you will astral project. Of course, there is a, uh, I can't remember if it was Mark Twain or somebody else who said, so it, it's really easy to fly. The hard part is just missing the ground. <laughs> you, can, you can fly, jump off a building, you're flying. The hard part is missing the ground when you fly. Yeah, satellites, they're falling, but they're falling around the earth, so they miss the ground. So here's a picture of sleep from infancy to very old age. And you can see that infants sleep, like I said, 16 hours a day. The older, older people sleep much less. And what we say 8.75 8 or 8.5 is right in this area, which is your teenage years. And that's the average that people will sleep. And then it will decrease and decrease and decrease until you're hopefully old enough to only need about five and, a, and three quarters hours of sleep. But this causes a major issue in nursing homes and hospitals and places where people are kept uh, in, in their old age because they haven't been told this. There's nurses and doctors that have zero information about sleep needs. And their older patients who don't need sleep, they're like, there's something wrong with you. You're supposed to have eight and a half hours of sleep, and you're only sleeping five and three quarter hours. We're going to have to give you a pill to keep you asleep. No, they don't. But it ruins their schedule. They don't want people walking around early. They have certain group of people that are there to take care of their, their patients. And they are, they're not supposed to be awake you know, earlier than 8 o'clock in the morning. So what's wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing. You just aren't supposed to sleep as long. And that can cause issues not just for the people at the old folks' homes, but also for you as well, because when you get to be older, you've been indoctrinated with eight and a half hours of sleep, eight and a half hours of sleep, and then you're not sleeping as much, and you think there might be something wrong with you. No. And remember, it's a spectrum anyway. Everything is a spectrum. Some people sleep longer. Some people sleep less. I need 10 hours of sleep. My wife, can, can she can do five hours of sleep, and she's fine. So it's eight and a half is the average. There are other types of altered states, and we're going to talk about these, that um, some of them are mental behaviors, some of them behavioral, and some of them Chemical means that you will alter your consciousness. So the first one, daydreaming, some, some of you already probably are. You're not thinking about what I'm saying anymore. You're off on, what am I going to have for lunch? Because I didn't have lunch before this class, and now I need, I'm hungry. You're not thinking about what I'm saying, or you're thinking about the, uh, the next class that you might have, or a date that you had last night, or another one that you're going to have tonight. So that's daydreaming, not paying attention to what you're supposed to be paying attention to. And daydreaming can get you in trouble. Well, for college, of course, you're not learning the material as well as you should be. But if you're doing something dangerous, like working with a table saw or something, then you better not be daydreaming. You better be paying attention to what you're doing. Or if you're a chef and you're cutting and you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you'll nick your finger off. So daydreaming is not necessarily a good thing, but we all do it. Everybody does it. And the hypnagogic state is the state between waking and sleeping. And for people who are, and I've already mentioned this, there are, it's a spectrum. We're supposed to wake up when we wake up. And if we're waking up from our dreams, we, our body should come right back to activity again because we are in sleep paralysis during REM sleep. If we wake up from sleep, REM sleep, we should immediately be awake and active, and some of us even jerk awake, because our bodies come back to life again, basically. But there are people who are much slower coming back to life, and in the hypnagogic state, they're awake, they're waking up, but their body is still in sleep paralysis. And they be, may be fully awake, but still in sleep paralysis. And that's very scary for some people be, for the first time it happens. It is a normal situation for a group of people on the ends. It's, uh, it is abnormal because it's not 
within the 68% norm, normal curve, but still, there are people who are on both sides of that curve, and some people come back to life much faster than others, and some people much slower than others. So everything's a spectrum. <laughs> And we define that spectrum by what's in the 68%, the one standard deviation of the normal distribution curve. That's normal. Everything outside of that is abnormal, but not necessarily pathological. However, people who, are, who have this slow response out of sleep paralysis, they can have some really weird dreams during that time when they're coming out of sleep and and they are still paralyzed. Uh, I remember, do you guys remember when the lottery hit $1 billion? $1 billion. And if you won that and just turned in the lottery ticket for the money straight, you would have gotten $500 million right out, of, just right into your bank account. All the taxes on it paid, everything done. $500 million. You don't remember that? None of you remember that? It was unbelievable. And I, I, I think I bought 50 tickets, won a dollar. <laughs> but I won a dollar. I did win one dollar. So I'm a winner. <laughs> I dreamed that I won the million dollars, the, the, the billion dollars. I dreamed I won it. And I was covered in money and holding all this money in my hands. And I woke up and I could still feel the money. I'm awake. I know I'm awake. I'm not sleeping anymore. I am awake. And I could feel the money in my hands from my dream. And then as soon as one finger jerked, the feeling went away. That's the hypnagogic state. We're going to talk about hypnosis and meditation and psychoactive drugs in this particular lecture. And I want to talk about deprivation tanks also. You guys still here? Can you hear me? Okay, good. I have a fan in the background because this is, uh, room is a little hot. So is that fan getting in the way of, my, of you hearing me? Okay, good. All right. So a sensory deprivation tank. Our brain takes in a whole lot of data. We've already talked about that, but we haven't gotten to sensation and perception yet. We'll, we'll talk about more of that in sensation and perception. But the senses all push data into the brain, and the brain likes that. It wants information. It does not like to be isolated. A sensory deprivation tank takes away all those senses. It is a tank full of water, that you lay down in. The water has so much salt in it that it is very buoyant, so you can just float without moving. You don't have to worry about sinking. It's like you're floating on air. The water is the same temperature as your skin, so you can't feel the water movement back and forth as you're breathing and moving a little bit in the water. When the tank is closed, the air in the tank is also made to be the same temperature as your skin. So you can't tell the difference between your skin, between the air and the water. It, they feel the same way. It is completely dark in there. There's no sound in it. There's no smells in it. There's no taste in it. Your brain is completely devoid of all senses. Very relaxing, extremely relaxing for about a half an hour. Most people can't make it much past a half an hour because the brain gets a little annoyed being all by itself, and so it starts to hallucinate. You start seeing things, hearing things, smelling things. It's like there's something there, and there's nothing there, nothing. And people can't spend very much time in it, but it is extremely relaxing to go into a deprivation tank and supposedly can help to alleviate some of your sleep debt if you have such a large amount of sleep debt that you're, you're going to fall asleep at the wheel, then you need to find a way to reduce that sleep debt. And some people just can't get enough sleep. There's not a way to do it. But this, a half an hour in the sensory deprivation tank is like four hours of sleep. And we'll talk about 
hypnosis, which is like eight hours of sleep for a half an hour. So you can make it up, but it, it, there's a deprivation facility in Virginia Beach. I think it's $100 for a half an hour to lay down in a deprivation tank. Are any of you, does that make, make you want to go see a deprivation tank and be in a deprivation tank? I don't see anybody responding to that. No, nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a movie about it made in 1980 with William Hurt uh, as a scientist who purposefully experimented on himself. I hope that by now, at least, you understand that scientists should not experiment on themselves, their children, or anyone they know because there's too much bias involved in that. Well. In this movie, he experimented on himself. He put himself into a deprivation tank. He took a whole bunch of drugs, and he reverted. His genes changed back into a Neanderthal. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. But there are people who have been tested in deprivation tanks for their job. They're placed into a deprivation tank for their job. astronauts because when they get to space there is no gravity they're just floating and the deprivation tank makes it feel like you're floating without any gravity so they were tested through this to see if they could make it through uh, <laughs> having an hour or two in space or more time in space if they could pass through the deprivation tank that way I don't think they use the deprivation tanks that way anymore. That was in the Apollo Mercury programs. But it was a pretty cool movie, uh, Altered States in 1980. So let's look at hypnosis. How many of you have heard of hypnosis? Some of you have heard of hypnosis? Yeah? Okay. Hypnosis actually does work. A half an hour in hypnosis is like eight hours of sleep. So if you have trouble, you're really, really far in sleep debt, it's a good idea to get more sleep. If you can't get more sleep, hypnosis is going to be a great way to do so. Go to a hypnotist and get hypnotized for a half an hour, and your brain resets itself for like eight hours of extra sleep. So it's a really good thing for that but it does some other pretty cool things also. Now, have any of you ever seen a hypnotic show where a hypnotist does his thing on stage? No? Some of you have, yay, very good. Now, one of the reasons why people don't, not in person, <laughs> see, yes, some of the reasons why people do not want to go to a hypnosis show is because they're afraid of getting hypnotized sitting in the audience. Are you? I don't want to go because I'm going to get hypnotized and I don't want to be hypnotized and then walk out of the place that I'm hypnotized. Nobody's like that. Well, that can't happen if you say, I refuse to allow you to hypnotize me. If a person says, I can't be hypnotized, I can hypnotize them. If a person says, I cannot be hypnotized, I say to them, really? Can I try? Sure, go ahead. They just gave me permission, and that's all I need. All I need is permission from their brain to take over. And so I can now hypnotize that person. Now, if they say, I will not be hypnotized, then they don't have not given me permission, and I cannot hypnotize them then. So permission is the first thing. Also, you have to have an IQ above 70. You have to have an IQ above 70 to get hypnotized. So a person who has said yes can be hypnotized. Go ahead, hypnotize me. But there's another part to it, and that's called suggestibility. Some people are extremely suggestible. Some people, not so much. And this guy on stage doing his, his hypnosis show, he only has an hour to do his show, so he needs people who are extremely suggestible. 
So first he says, is there anybody in the audience who would like to be hypnotized? And guaranteed, there's always at least a dozen people who raise their hand, I want to be hypnotized, me, me, me. Come on up. So he takes them up on stage. Now he has to find out how suggestible they are. So he has them hold out their hands and close their eyes. And he says to them something like this. Imagine that there is a, a attached to your right hand, I'm going to tie a bag to the right hand. And the left hand, I'm going to tie a balloon. And I'm going to fill that balloon up with helium. And that balloon is going to get pretty big. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It is pulling your hand up toward the sky. In the other hand, I'm going to put a bag, uh, that bag I'm going to fill with sand. It's getting pretty heavy. It's hard to hold that up because that, that is a heavy bag. And I'm putting more and more sand into it. And if somebody ends up like this, they're very suggestible. The other people that are still like this on stage, go on back to your seat. I don't have time to, to, to I can hypnotize you, but I don't have time to hypnotize you. Go back to your seats. So they go back to their seats, and he, and he hypnotizes the rest of them. Now, you can't make a person who is hypnotized do something that they don't, would never do. It's against their morals, against their principles, against their ethics. So I can't hypnotize somebody on stage and go, you're at home. Imagine you're at home. You're in your, you're in your home. There's nobody else at home. You're in your own room. You're, and it's hot. The air conditioner is not working. And it is a hot, hot sum, summer day. And you've opened the windows and you've turned on a fan. Uh, the fan stopped working. Oh, no, it's getting even hotter. And just take your clothes off. <laughs> they will not. You will not get a person to take their clothes off in front of a whole audience. That just won't happen. Or even in front of just the, uh, the hypnotist if it was an individual session. So you cannot make a person, no, no, there are people who are exhibitionists. They would take off their clothes because they're exhibitionists. They don't care that people see them naked. They would go to a nude beach. So you would never try this anyway simply because they could have been an exhibitionist and they would do that. But you don't. It's just that is unprofessional. So you can't make a person who is a pacifist into an assassin. <laughs> Hollywood loves to do that. No, it won't happen. You can't hypnotize a person into doing something that's against their nature. But if they have motivation to do something and the motivation isn't strong enough, we can motivate them to do a better job of what it is that they want to do, but they just don't have the energy to get it done. We'll improve that energy rating. So hypnotizability is the degree to which an individual is responsive to hypnotic suggestion not all people are hypnotizable because they have to be 70 or above, but everyone who says they can't be, can be. Those who say they won't be, will not be. And although it is used as a stage trick by a lot of performers, there are a lot of positive, practical aspects to hypnosis. One of those is uh, hypnotic analgesia. Hypnotic analgesia means I can hypnotize you and tell you you will not feel pain. You can then go to get your tooth extracted without any, any Novocaine and you will not feel any pain because the hypnotic suggestion is you will not feel pain. So it diminishes your sensitivity to pain while under hypnosis, if that's the case, if that's what they're trying to do. Well, surgery can be performed without the use of drugs then. But... I have, my wife and I have a friend, uh, she was pregnant and she was about to have her baby and she was in the hospital. And uh, she said, she's, I'm going to have natural childbirth. I'm not going to have any drugs. And she's saying this as the first contractions hit. <laughs> she goes, I'm going to have natural, <laughs> give me drugs, give me drugs. <laughs> so, we prefer the drugs uh, over the possibility of being able to do it without any drugs. And the same thing is true even with hypnosis. People don't trust the hypnosis. Plus, how long are you going to have to be 
wait to get hypnotized. Not everyone is very suggestible. So you don't go into the hospital and the hospital waits for a hypnosis to hip, a hypnotist to hip, hypnotize you. It, give them a shot of the drug and 10 seconds later, has anybody ever had uh, a surgery where you're given drugs that knock you out and they say count backwards from 10? Nobody? I've never made it to five. <laughs> I don't ever remember making it to five. So even with uh, the, some of the less um, intense knockout drugs, all right, Dazzlin, I, I never made it past five. Ten, nine, eight, seven, I'm gone. Gone. So you don't want to wait. The doctors don't want to wait for somebody to hypnotize you and then convince you you're not going to feel any pain. Just give them a drug and get it over with. And that's why it isn't used that much widely, even though it can be used for that purpose. And of course, motivation. At COA, there are three psychology professors. I'm one of them. And the three of us got together and pooled our money once, got some money from COA also. And we hired a hypnotist to come and talk to our classes. So he came one day and we, and we had all our classes together in a big room and he talked to them all. It was just, it was really cool. But then he also stayed and he did a hyp hypnosis show for the region out of the PAC Center. And the, he, so the three of us are there because we're basically the hosts. We, we brought him in and we introduced him and then he did his show. And of course he said, is there anybody in the audience who wants to, you know, get hypnotized? And there was a little 12 year old girl raised her hand, me, 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 me. And he said, are those your parents? Yeah. Is it okay with you if she comes up? And they were like, fine, it's fine with them. So she came up and she got hypnotized. She was very suggestible. And he hypnotized her and he hypnotized all the other people. And they went through their, his little routine. And then he woke each one of them up individually and sent them back to their seats. And for her, he left her as the last one, the 12 year old, as the last one. And she's still standing on stage, hypnotized, and he turns around to her parents. He says, where are her parents? Where? Oh, there you are. Is there anything that you want her to do that she doesn't do very well? And they said, oh, my God, clean her room. She picks up things uh, here and there, but she just doesn't do a really good job of cleaning her room. So he turned around, and he whispered in her ear. And I wasn't close enough to hear what he whispered. But... The show was that he woke her up and he sent her back to her, her um, seat. And this is called post-hypnotic suggestibility. The show's over. And I'm standing at the back of the stage, uh, front of the stage. You know the PAC Center at COA, uh, if you've been to the auditorium. And he comes down the steps. And I'm there with him as the people come down and meet him and say, thank you. And, and it was great. What a wonderful show. Can I have a card? You know, I have some stuff that I want to talk to you about. So he's handing out his cards and he's saying, thank you. And you're welcome and to everybody. And I can see up the aisle, here's the, here's the couple, this, this, these parents with the daughter. And they're standing in line waiting to come down, slowly coming down the aisle. And she's pulling on her mom's dress. And her mom's going, cut it out. We'll go home in a minute. Cut it out. And we're just going to go up and talk to this guy. Just stop it. Stop it. And I, she gets close enough. I can hear her mom says, what? Already? What? And she says, I need to go home and clean my room. <laughs> that is increasing motivation. That's, I guess, the number one reason that people use for therapy hypnosis to increase motivation. She did have some motivation to clean her room, but not much. And what he did was to give implant an improved motivation to do that particular thing that she wanted to do. You cannot drag your husband to a hypnotist because you want your husband to stop smoking. He has to want to stop smoking and have some motivation to stop smoking. He wants to try to stop smoking. My dad was a smoker. I said, Dad, you got to quit. you got to quit smoking. He says, I can quit. I quit in between every cigarette. <laughs> dad, really? <laughs> so you have to have 
motivation to quit smoking or quit drinking or quit eating or whatever it is that or do your homework more <laughs> some of you need to work on that one uh, so you can increase your motivation through hypnosis of course something like cleaning your room or doing your more homework that motivation is all psychological but stop drinking stop smoking that's psychological and physical as well you are addicted to the nicotine you are addicted to the alcohol and that's a physical thing that we can't help with hypnosis with hypnosis we can help you you know people that smoke cigarettes they got to have something in their hands they just have to have that thing that they're smoking all the time and if they don't have it they feel uncomfortable they don't feel right they're all so we can help them to feel comfortable without a cigarette we can improve their motivation to quit smoking but they're addicted to nicotine and so they also need the nicotine patch or nicotine gum which gives them the nicotine through the patch or the gum so that they're getting it that way instead of through the cigarette and that then can be decreased slowly so you you have a high dosage of nicotine the first week half the dosage the next week a quarter of the dosage the next week and you keep reducing the amount of nicotine till they don't need the nicotine anymore you need both when you have an addiction and a psychological dependence an addiction is not psychological dependence because psychological dependence when you are dependent on something psychologically then getting rid of it does not cause withdrawal symptoms and a, and we know a person is addicted when they have withdrawal symptoms when you take it away from them so we can improve the motivation of people through hypnosis any questions about hypnosis no 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 okay the next one we can change our consciousness awareness of the world through meditation Meditation is the exact opposite of hypnosis. Hypnosis is all about me. I want to improve my getting rid of sugar in my diet. Sugar is a massively bad thing for us. And I have reduced my sugar because my doctor told me my liver was dying. I have NASH, non-alcoholic sugar hepatitis, which destroys the liver. And it's not caused by alcohol, where alcoholic hepatitis is caused by the alcohol. Alcoholics get hepatitis. Of the liver this is non alcoholic sugar hepatitis NASH and it's because I have too much sugar in my diet I used to drink three Mountain Dews every single day and I would drink and Snickers is my favorite I just yeah, I would eat three Snickers with those <laughs> a huge amount of sugar plus bread has sugar in it pasta has sugar in it so there's sugar everywhere in our life and I was way too much sugar so I had to cut it out I've, I've dropped 15 pounds because I stopped sugar in my diet some I haven't dropped all sugar and you have to drop the the non sugar sweeteners also because it turns out when you drink saccharin or some other it just keeps the desire for sugar there because of the sweetener you have to get rid of the sweet and it's amazing I can walk into a grocery store and with my nose I can find the sugar aisle because I can smell sugar in the air now because I have less sugar in my diet I, it's amazing so but my liver has come back online again which is nice it's healed itself and the doctor said that there are four-year-olds today that are being diagnosed with NASH their livers are failing at four years of age because they're getting too much sugar in their diet from the sugar drinks that we give them and the sugar the, the candies that we give them and they're not going outside and playing and wearing it off through energy use they're just sitting around watching TV or playing on their computers now so it's that's bad that's really bad and they said that as I was looking up what this stuff was that by the year 2025 the majority of liver transplants is going to be because of NASH by 2025 
we're seeing it increase in the population so much. And all you have to do is drop sugar out of your diet. So meditation, let's get back. So meditation is a form of consciousness change induced by focusing on repetitive behaviors, assuming certain body positions, regulating your breathing, and it's all about getting rid of who you are. Not me, it's not about me, which is why I started that NASH study. It's not about hypnosis helping me to get rid of something. It's about becoming one with the universe, losing yourself. Stop thinking. You know how hard that is? You say, you close your eyes and you say, all right, I'm going to stop thinking. Wait, I'm thinking about stopping thinking. No, I shouldn't think about stopping. Don't, shut up, shut up. <laughs> it's very hard not to think, to just clear your mind. And that's a part of meditation, to become one with the universe, to lose yourself in meditation. And meditation, again, is an extremely good way to catch up on your sleep debt. It works really well. Self-meditation. It also helps all kinds of other biological phenomenon in your body. So you, you actually improve yourself through meditation in lots of different ways. There's a joke about a Buddhist priest. The meditation is from the Buddhist philosophies is where it began, uh, Taoism. And the Buddhist priest is walking down the sidewalk in New York. They're vegetarians, obviously. You, I hope you know that about Buddhists. And they, this, this monk, priest, monk, uh, ha, is walking down and passes a hot dog vendor on the street who's yelling, hot dogs, hot dogs, you want a hot dog, hot dog, hey, monk, you want a hot dog? He's like, no, I'm vegetarian. Hey, I got vegetarian hot dogs. Really? <laughs> yep, they're made out of plant proteins. It's not anything that has to do with meat, absolutely meatless. You want to try one? Sure, I'll try one of those. So he takes out the hot dog, puts it in the bun, says, what do you want on it? I got mustard, ketchup, mayonnaise, sauerkraut, relish. Hmm, says the Buddhist monk. Make me one with everything. Make me one with the universe. Make me one with everything. All right, you didn't like that joke. Okay. And I tell you these jokes purposely to get you back to, to listening again, even though they're bad jokes. So meditation is a form of altering your consciousness in order to lose yourself. Very different than hypnosis. And then we come to drugs. Alcohol is a drug. There's lots of other drugs, including medication that the doctors give you. There are drugs as well. And food can also be a substance that is abused. So using a substance, and that's any substance, when use of that substance causes the person not to, demeet, not to meet the demands of life. So why food? Because some people eat so much that they get all kinds of problems, like my liver being destroyed, I'm eating sugar too much. So substance abuse, that was sugar abuse. Okay? But we usually talk about alcohol as a substance abuse and, of course, illegal drugs. But then legal drugs also, medications can also be abused. So addiction can lead to numerous life-threatening and illegal activities to acquire the next dose. And sometimes you don't even know that you have gone out to, you're, you're a, a person who is an addict can be using the drug and not even remember where they got the drug. Complete memory loss while they're out there stealing something in order to get the drug. So addiction is caused by tolerance and physical dependence, psych physical, physiological dependence. That's addiction. We do not say psychological dependence is addiction because you don't get withdrawals when you are, fit, when you are psychologically dependent on something and you, get, and you lose it. You don't go through withdrawals. It's not the same thing. So tolerance means having to take more of that substance to achieve the same results because the effect of the substance is reduced after repeated use. And I could give you a great example of tolerance because we do this to our children all the time. A, a child comes up and interrupts you. You're talking to another, another adult and the child interrupts you and you say, no, you have to wait your turn. 
and then they interrupt again. No, you have to wait your turn. And they do it again and again and again. Eventually, they interrupt you and you just completely ignore them. It wasn't enough. You're getting so used to the interruption, you didn't even notice they interrupted you. You became tolerant to the behavior. So what do they have to do? They have to get worse. They have to do something even stronger to get your attention. And that's what happens with drugs. When you become tolerant to the drug, you don't have the same response to the same amount of that drug. You need more of it. And that's one of the problems with addiction and psychological dependence. So substance abuse, uh, physiological dependence is the body's dependence on the drug. Psychological dependence is the mind's dependence on the drug. It's a pervasive desire to use the drug and is independent of the physical addiction. Some drugs are both physically and psychologically addicting. Some are just physically addicting. Some just psychologically addicting. And it can produce, when you have psychological dependence, it can produce temporary memory failure where you don't even remember where you got the drug from. And I could give you a good example of, of this. Uh, many of you drive, and you drive long distances sometimes, and it's the same trip that you've taken a hundred times, and you get to a certain point in the trip and you go, how did I get here? I don't remember, I didn't even remember getting out of my driveway. Is that anybody ever had that? There's like, you, I, there was a turn I was supposed to take. I took the turn because I'm where I'm supposed to be, but I don't remember it at all. That's temporary memory failure. <laughs> so withdrawal is the pattern of painful physical symptoms and cravings when the drug is removed, and withdrawal indicates addiction, but it is not what causes addiction. Causes addiction is your body's dependence on that particular thing. So, and the, and um, your, your tolerance of that particular thing. So, withdrawal indicates addiction. Uh, how many of you have ever tried, I mean, I just told you, I, I, I had to get off of Mountain Dew. I took three of them every day, and that has caffeine in it. Caffeine is just as addicting as cocaine is, and so is nicotine. Nicotine, cocaine, and caffeine are all just as addicting. Now, nicotine and caffeine don't do any real damage to you. Cocaine does a lot of damage to you. So, have any of you tried to get off of a drink, sugar drink, or a caffeinated drink, and you go through withdrawal symptoms? You shake, you have headaches, you sweat. It's very difficult. It takes about six months. Six months. It's coffee, same thing, caffeine. Smoking, nicotine. Chocolate, and of course, sugar are all very addicting. Let's talk about the psychoactive drugs then. We're going to see six, four, four psychoactive drugs. Uh, and these are chemicals that affect your mental processes and behavior. They often will um, change the way that your neurotransmitters are affected in your brain. Uh, illegal use of drugs in the United States has declined overall, but heroin is still a huge thing in the United States. And some teen, it seems to be catching on with teenagers for some reason, and we're not really sure what that is, uh, but people are studying the fact that teenagers seem to be increasing their drug use instead of decreasing it like the rest of us are. Hallucinogens are those things that make us hallucinate. Where am I? I've got 15 minutes left. So hallucinogens, hallucinogens make us hallucinate. Uh, they alter perceptions of the external environment and inner, inner world. They're also called psychedelics, and they alter the perceptions of reality. These drugs affect the receptor sites for serotonin in the brain. They are, they, some of them are mescaline, LSD, PCP or angel dust, cannabis or marijuana, and ecstasy. Use of these drugs leads to paranoid delusions and impaired coordination as well as brain neuron damage. Now, it's a spectrum people, LSD is a strong freaking psychedelic. It can do damage immediately. Cannabis, marijuana, is a very weak one. THC is very weak. 
And so it takes a long time for it to do damage. I'm all for the use of medical marijuana, but the use of marijuana just for recreational purposes, especially in teenagers, that's not a good deal because they're going to stay on that marijuana for the rest of their lives, most likely. And by the time they're in their 60s, they're going to do some major damage to their brains. So LSD is a synthetic drug made by humans. Cannabis is derived from the hemp plant. Does anybody, what else is the hemp plant besides marijuana, THC? What else does the hemp plant give us? Anybody? Nobody knows what the hemp, have you ever heard of hemp rope? Hemp rope? I only have two yeses. Are the rest of you there? Okay. Hemp rope is very, very powerful rope. And it's made from the hemp plant, from the fibers of the hemp plant. There's also bricks you can make out of, out of hemp. And they're much better at insulating than regular brick is. So you can have a much better insulated house if you cover it with hemp bricks. Of course, if the house burns down, the whole neighborhood's there sniffing the smoke, but that's not true. It's not that there are, there is hemp that has THC in it and there's hemp that doesn't. And the federal government has always said, no, we're not going to deal with the hemp. Which one are you, which one are you growing? Regular hemp or not? So no, there's just no hemp growth at all. Now, Colorado and many states have said that it's okay now to grow hemp and to buy marijuana and to sell marijuana in the states. So the state police, you could be smoking marijuana right in front of a state policeman, but a DEA agent can walk up and arrest you because they're the federal government, and the federal government has not okayed marijuana. So you can still be arrested even in a state where it's okay for the state, but the federal government's agents can still arrest you for it. That's a problem still. Hopefully the federal government will figure that out soon. But uh, marijuana and hashish contain the same drug, THC, uh, but hashish is much more potent. And there's lots of variations of hemp plants today, marijuana plants today. Some of them have very little THC to no THC. Some of them have tremendous amounts of THC. And m regular marijuana use for the lower levels you get used to it, you get tolerant, so then you go to a higher level of THC, and then to a higher level of THC, and then to a higher level of THC, until THC just doesn't do it for you anymore, and then you go to a, a different drug. So it is one of the gateway drugs. And as I said, it can do damage to you over the long term, but for medical use, so does opiates. They do damage to you over the long term. So why not use marijuana? It has some negative side effects, but every drug has negative side effects. And my father was an, uh, was an opiates for pain when, before he passed away. And I kept telling him, Dad, you need to get on marijuana. Instead, the opiates are bad. You know, you're, they're not working for you. They make you nutty. You know, you'd be much better off in marijuana. He's like, I don't want to get addicted to marijuana. <laughs> Dad, you're 83 years old. You're not going to get addicted to the, you're not going to live long enough to get addicted to it. So, but he's taking opiates, which are highly addictive. So that's the opiates, uh, are highly physically and psychologically addictive. They produce a sense of well-being. They have strong pain relief uh, properties. These drugs resemble the body's own pain relieving drugs called the endorphins, which we've talked about. It was the Bayer Corporation that actually discovered heroin and dropped it after testing showed it was addictive properties, but it took a long time for them to show that, and they actually had a cough medicine, Bayer heroin cough medicine. Believe me, when you took a swig of that, you did not cough. <laughs> it was, you were cough free, but you then became addicted to heroin. So heroin is still a major problem in the United States. Uh, the medical use of opiates is for the reduction of pain. That's the whole purpose of opiates because they take over for our endorphins, which we can only produce so much of. And if our pain is too much for the endorphins to handle, then we need some extra pain relieving. So opium actually means the plant of joy. And Edgar Allan Poe was addicted to it. He went to opium dens all the time. 
and that might be one of the reasons why his his stories are so weird because he was he was high on opium and morphine was used in the civil war to help people because it stopped the pain when a person had to have their arms sawed off or their legs sawed off after getting shot and they give them the morphine they didn't feel the pain but they also found out that if, if a person was addicted to opium, you could give them morphine, and they didn't want their opium anymore. And then they became addicted to morphine. So not a very good response. Uh, heroin was found by the Bayer Corporation used as a cough suppressant. And for people who were addicted to morphine, you could give them heroin. And guess what? They didn't want their morphine anymore. And then we found out they become addicted to heroin. It's a cycle. It's just a horrible cycle. Codeine, again, oxycodone, there are all kinds of opiates out there that we become addicted to. And an interesting fact about heroin itself is that the addicts can die if they change the location of their fix. So they get their fix, they go to a specific location, and they shoot up. And the reaction that they get from heroin also includes where they are. Whatever the environment is that they're in, they become tolerant not only to the, the drug, but they become tolerant to the surroundings, their environment. And they have to take more and more and more of the drug. They can do that to get the, the feeling, but they can't, you know, they're, they're still in the exact same place all the time. Now they're on a really high dosage of heroin. And they go to their normal place. They just got their heroin from their drug dealer. And they go to their normal place to get to take it, but there are police everywhere. So they go to a different location to shoot up with this high dosage of heroin. And their brain cannot take it because it's a brand new environment that they're not tolerant to. And on a high, high dose of the heroin, their brain just explodes. Not even not explodes, but they can't take it and they have a heart attack, they die from the same fix that would have been okay in that location where they were normally, they're in a new no location and they die because of the new location. Depressants are the way that most people try to commit suicide or commit overdoses by accident. It's the number one cause of, of uh, drug overdose. It slows down your mental and physical activities. It slows down the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls your breathing and your heart rate. You slow it down to the point where it's not functioning anymore. You're not breathing and, you're not, and your heart isn't beating. You die. So a big problem with depressants. Alcohol is a depressant. So they are barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and uh, alcohol. And barbiturates give pleasant euphoria in small doses. Well, so does alcohol. You have this problem. It's just, it's just a horrible, horrible day. It's just terrible. You go and you have a shot of alcohol, and it mellows you out. And you don't feel as bad. And that's great. Let me have another shot, and then another shot. And then and you lose control. And if you, if you are a person who is an alcoholic, the first thing that the Alcoholics Anonymous wants you to do is to admit you are an alcoholic. Yeah, people go to Alcoholics Anonymous because they're dragged there, but that doesn't mean that they admit that they're alcoholics. You have to admit alcohol has control over you. You do not have control over the alcohol. Now, alcohol is a legal drug. So people self-medicate. They don't feel good, so they take alcohol. It makes them feel better and until they pass out and they do stupid things while they're, while they're drunk, and they don't get their jobs done right, so they get, lose their jobs, they lose their cars, they lose their, their, their houses from being alcoholics. And we'll talk a little bit more about alcohol in just a minute, but uh, an interesting side effect of barbiturate withdrawal is that if, you, if somebody is on barbiturates and they have increased the number of barbiturates increased because they're tolerant, they need more and more and more of the barbiturates, and you find out, you're on, give me those. You take them away and make them go cold turkey, they will die. You never take away barbiturates cold turkey. You give them a, the same amount they've had 
reduce it a little bit, the next time, reduce it a little bit, the next time, reduce it, come slowly down off of barbiturates. Do not go cold turkey off of barbiturates. The alcohol is just a, it's just a terrible product. Um, I am not the kind of person that says never drink alcohol, but you need to have control over your alcohol. And if you're an addict, you will never have control over the alcohol again. It will always have control over you. Now I'm an Ashkenazi, it's a, that's my background, my genetics, and I have, <laughs> I have genetic, in, in me, genetics, that makes me have massive headaches if I drink alcohol. So I will never be an alcoholic. I take a little bit every once in a while for religious purposes, but I do not want alcohol very much because I get horrible headaches from it. So Ashkenazis never become alcoholics. However, they can become cocaine addicts and other, you know, it's not that they can't be an addict, they just aren't going to be an addict for alcohol. So women metabolize alcohol on their liver, and men metabolize alcohol, half of it, in their stomach. The rest of it gets into them, and then they metabolize it in their liver. So a woman drinking the same amount as a man will get liver disease faster than the man does because half of his is destroyed in his stomach. And alcohol contributes to sudden infant death syndrome, as we've already talked about. Uh, it, it contributes to mental retardation. In fact, fetal alcohol syndrome, mental retardation, is the number one cause of mental retardation that can be eliminated. There, there's no reason for fetal alcohol syndrome retardation. The mental deficiency uh, caused by fetal alcohol syndrome is caused by women who are drinking while they're pregnant. But women don't know that they're pregnant right away. They could be drinking, having a good time, and they could be pregnant for a month sometimes two months before they really realize or recognize or accept the fact that they're pregnant and they've been drinking the whole time and doing damage to their child, growing in the womb. So if you are an active woman and you are not protecting yourself, then you should not be drinking. And if you are protecting yourself with drugs, the pill, the patch, the shot, whatever it is that you're taking to not be pregnant and you get a cold and they give you Antibiotics, the antibiotics interact with those drugs and destroy them. There's, they're like you're not taking anything. You can get pregnant just as easily as you could if you weren't taking them at all. So be aware of that as well. And then there's stimulants. Um, oh, and we're basically at the end of class, so I'm going to stop right here. I'll take up stimulants and then go on to the learning chapter next week. But if you have not put your name down in the chat box and said here please do that if you want to stay around and talk afterwards ask me questions I'm here for that if not then have a good night and Wednesday I will see you on Thursday bye stay healthy